preparing. <clears throat> and uh, this comes out of this month's Wines and Vines. And that's their uh, data issue. And if you can look at a copy in our library, there's several uh, pages of data of some interest. But this one I thought was the best single page of data. Uh, which gives you some idea of what's happening in the planting of grapes in California. This is not required, it's just I thought it would be of interest to you to have. But looking at that long column of data, look at the one, two, three, look at the fourth column, the percentage of non-bearing. And then go down there and pick up some of those like Petit Sarah is 65.9% still non-bearing. Or Ruby Red, 80%. And on down the line. Or Barbera, as you said, 82%. Still not into production. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been reading Leon Adams' new book, and I'm not here to plug it, but I read quite a bit over the weekend. And uh, when you read his scary stories about the ups and falls of the California wine industry, it scares you a little bit. Things like grapes getting down to $10 a ton <laughs> and wine 10 cents a gallon uh, in some of these ups and downs. Uh, when you look at this column here and then read his story right after it, the two sort of scare you a little bit about where we're going. So I'm giving you this, and also gave you that handout that uh, Mr. Bowers wrote for Napa Valley. So um, move into this great planning business with a little bit of caution. I myself feel that we are pretty safe. That's what everybody else has felt in the past too, I guess. <laughs> uh, especially when we're going for a high quality as most of this fourth column shows, I really don't see how we can be too scared. But don't go out plant grapes, as I've told a lot of you individually, figuring you're going to get today's prices. Go out and figure that you get, at the best, two-thirds of today's prices. And then if you can do that, maybe you've got a, a good chance. Okay, the other handout we'll discuss at the end of the lecture, so the first of it, uh, and all of you have it, I guess. Last time, just at the end of class, I gave you these about five or six uh, re uh, types of summer pruning. And I said, let's just itemize them for the moment, and then we'd go over them today. So that's what we want to do today. But right at the end of class, <clears throat> Somebody came up and said, is uh, double pruning, summer pruning? And uh, <laughs> that sort of threw me, put me off. Um, we don't normally think of double pruning as summer pruning. But in keeping with the definition I gave you, that the pruning of any green material is summer pruning, then we have to say that double pruning is summer pruning. If you do it, actually if you do it after the vineyard begins to look green. So that happens to be another type of summer pruning which I hadn't thought about before. Okay, uh, when I gave you this outline, I said one type of summer pruning, the most important type, is the training of young vines. And that is, of course, in to uh, do the extreme of cutting down the number of growing points so that you get good vigor in the ones that you want left to make the permanent framework of the vine. And this includes disbudding, suckering, pinching, topping, what have you, to train the vine. And just to put a little interest into it, although you've already had some of these slides, let's look at a few slides as we go along. It gets boring if you just get the notes. 
This happens to be the craziest screen in town, I think, but it works sometimes. Okay, you do get the lights. <coughs> Most of these slides you've seen before, but let's just look at them just to refresh ourselves that this is summer pruning. You see, uh, I said the training of young vines. And here's a young vine ready to be trained. You want a divertic growth into one shoot. So you pull all the shoots off except one and tie it up. Next slide. As this shows. And you'll be doing this next week or the week after. This is summer pruning. The removal of all these shoots, disbudding or desuckering, not desuckering, but disbudding <coughs> to divert all the growth into one shoot. Next slide. <coughs> And another type of summer pruning is, as I say, pulling out of laterals. Um, see, here we have that single shoot tied up, but we've got a lot of laterals in here. You see them coming out all along. And part of summer pruning is the removal of these laterals. As I told you repeatedly out in class during the dormant pruning season, that on head trained vines, you don't want any laterals left below knee high. And on uh, cordon or cane pruned vines, you don't want to leave any higher than pocket high. So, uh, and of course, remember my joke to you about uh, cordon training is that you don't want to pull out all the laterals all the way up because you've got to save these two to, to go under the wire. And that sounds silly, but I told you my experience of that where we didn't get around to putting the wire up until the shoots were way up the top of the stake. And I didn't go out and check them in and they were pulling all these laterals off right up to the top of the stake. That sort of hurts. Okay, so pulling out laterals. But uh, that was in, that happened to be in Mexico, but uh, uh, department students are just as bad. Because even though I give this lecture and talk about it and go out in the field with you, Every year, somebody goes out and pulls everything off, leaves and everything. <laughs> and that isn't funny, but it happens every year. And sometimes I think they must do it to be funny, but uh, because they can't be that stupid, but uh, that's what happens. They pull all the leaves and all the laterals and everything else off, leave me nothing but a stick, like this. <laughs> Don't you do it this year. I'm going to take this one out there and hit you with it. Uh, and here it is after they, those laterals were pulled off to leave nothing but the single shoot with only the leaves. What's wrong with this? They didn't take the clusters off. Also, I don't know why. Dr. Leiter took this picture, and I don't know why they didn't pull the clusters off. But you're supposed to pull the clusters off and the laterals. Pulling off clusters is a type of summer pruning. It's removal of green vegetative parts while the vine is growing. And you'll do that, of course, and I'll show you that in the last slide here in a few moments. Yes? No, they, okay, oh, I want this slide too, yeah. No, they, no, they'll probably set, but they'll weaken the vine. Now, show me the next slide, will you please? And this is also called this budding, training your own vines because this is the, sh the cordon, remember, that you saw in, in 116A that went from here up to the top and out last year. And that means this is a one-year-old cane. And it'll have fruit on it, just like the, the uh, branches will up there. But you've got to disbud it. This is the actual term disbudding, where it comes in. Excuse me, it's the uh, pulling off of these uh, shoots when they're anywhere from an inch to three inches long, as shown in the next slide. And this shows them just taken off all the way up into the axles there, or into this crotch of the plant. So, now, I guess the next slide, too. Uh, we're, talk we're still talking about summer pruning under the number one reason I gave you, the training of young vines and the topping of them to make the cordon, leaving these two shoots, is summer pruning. 
Okay, next slide. Remember, wait a minute, back up just a moment. Remember, those of you that uh, I harped and harped and harped on the idea that when you top a vine for cordon training, make sure that you top it so that the top shoe is below the wire. Some people, if you move those shears up one inch and make a cut, you foul up the whole works. Because then that shoot comes out and this shoot comes out. And how are you going to bend this shoot down and tie it to here without breaking it off? Just a movement of one inch makes a difference. OK, next slide. And this is summer proning, the cleaning out of unnecessary growth on these young vines. Here it is before. And the next slide is afterwards. Takes off quite a bit, doesn't it? But you have to do it to thin it out, to make those uh, spur positions six to eight inches apart. You have disbudded the trunk, and you've uh, taken off. Actually, this is a form of, of crown suckering, but not usually thought of it in this sense, since this is training of young vines. We'll talk about crown suckering a little later. But this is part of the training of young vines, then, to do this. Next slide. Well, remember, crown, uh, summer pruning is depressive, doubly depressing compared to winter because of this matter of pulling off uh, uh, shoots that don't have fruit on them. OK, I'll leave that one for now. So those are various ways in which you can use summer pruning in the training of young vines. This budding, uh, pinching, topping. Uh, I might for a moment just mention an important definition in, in, our, in our department. It's the difference between pinching and topping. Another little fine point. In pinching, we take off anywhere from two to maybe four inches off the top of this chute. And all we're trying to do in pinching and taking off two or three or four inches is to slow down the growth of the chute for a few days, five, six, eight days, until it hardens up a little bit. And then this next single bud will take over and start to grow. That's pinching. In topping, the same type of deal, we take off anywhere from 12 to 18 inches or more. And it has an entirely different effect on the vine because you take off. Uh, put the chute on down here, you take off about 12 inches. And then the vine doesn't just stop and let this bud take off. More, all of these buds then are more or less mature. So then instead of getting just one to take off, hopefully you get all of these to come out more or less together. Now this is an extremely important principle in the growing of grapes. That if you cut off just the tip, it'll just sit there for a few days, and the next shoot will take off and start to grow. But if you cut off a big chunk of it, then maybe three or four or more of the shoots buds below will push, and relatively uniformly. And this is what's involved in the training of cordons, for example, where I said, be sure and take off plenty. Let it go way up. And then cut off the top so those next two shoots in there below come out more or less equally and bigger. But if you just go out and get in a hurry and tra head training vines or carding vines and cut off four inches at the top the moment it gets four inches above the wire, you've had it because you're just going to do this. You can go back two weeks later and do the same thing again. So tipping and topping are quite different in, in what they do to a vine. OK, uh, we talked about this matter of, of uh, pulling out the laterals. 
We also have the problem, which I did not show, of, of suckering vines. Uh, most of you, after Dr. Yali got through beating you over the head, know now that you're supposed to take the buds off of rootstocks uh, when you're making the sign grafts. But uh, a lot of people don't do this or don't know they're supposed to, and you get a lot of suckers coming up from the rootstock. And uh, uh, this is, again, fairly important because if you've got the top here, like this, growing out, and uh, the cyan union somewhere about here, wait a minute, hopefully above the, the cyan union, roughly right in here. If this rootstock has not been disbudded, the cyan, the uh, union itself, acts a little bit like a girdle so that the buds above it don't really have, even though they have polarity effect, much of this is canceled out by the uh, girdling effect of this union of the, of where you made the graft. So that if anything at all happens to the top, bam, up come your suckers from the rootstock. Now if these suckers come up from the rootstock, then they get leaves out here. Uh, you don't help yourself by just cutting them off at the soil surface because you've got two or three nodes below that so that when you cut off one this year and feel that you've done the job, next year you can cut off three or four. What you've got to do is to dig down, expose this uh, sucker, and then yank it out. And that's the best way. Then you pull it out by pulling out a chunk of wood, a little chunk of wood with it, like this. But isn't it so much easier just to do it on the cutting before you ever make the graft? That's why Dr. Alley chewed at you so much when you left buds on those uh, rootstocks. It makes a terrific cost effect when you can just do it with a pair of pruning shears and uh, do it on the cutting before rather than waiting till you plant it and have to go out and use a shovel and dig down do all this business to get the suckers off. So this is bad on a grafted vine. You can also get the effect on an own rooted vine, but of course that isn't so bad. It's bad because you've got the own rooted vine here, but you don't have that differential effect here, and usually unless something happens to the top, you're not going to get many suckers from below, and but you may get them anyway. But, if it, but uh, in a way, you are sort of got insurance because of one, if this top dies, you, you've got a good chance that one of these other buds in here will start to grow. But it's really important not to have buds on the rootstock uh, of, of grafted vines for this reason here. And this is especially true, and most importantly true, with St. George rootstock, in which uh, give it a chance and it'll throw a, it'll throw a sucker and give you trouble. Okay, now uh, we go to the other uh, really main type of summer pruning, and that's crown suckering. And this is where I get into my glory of griping, because it isn't a crown, it isn't a sucker. But this is a term that's been established for thinning out of a, the, the top of a vine. You see, in pomology, the crown of a plant is at the ground surface. And by definition in this class, repeatedly, a sucker is a shoot that arises from beneath the ground surface. So this term crown suckering is completely wrong in that it's not the crown, it's not a sucker. You'd have to call it a head de water sprouting, I guess, because that's what it is, <laughs> head de water sprouting. But this is a term that you've got to learn to live with, even though it's a, an erroneous term. But let's look at a few pictures of crown sucker, and then we'll talk about why we do it. And then you'll see why we do it, I should say. Now, here's a vine 
you can see that it's pretty uh, much of a mass of growth. Remember, you've got to get sulfur dust into this plant to control mildew. And the definition of controlling mildew is to cover every millimeter of leaf surface with sulfur dust, including the clusters. Can you do it in a vine like that? Not very well. So you've got to thin it out. So the next slide shows this one thinned out. And I'm showing this to shock you because this is too much. <laughs> you only, remember I told you that you don't go out and pull shoots off of, summer shoots off of vines unless you have a reason. The reason here was just to open the vine up enough to get sulfur dust and spray materials into. They sort of overdid it a little bit here. This is what we call bald-headed vines. And this, will, this uh, doesn't help the vine at all to be exposed to the summer heat all year long like this. And furthermore, the shoots that were pulled off could have been, you could have left a, a half a dozen judiciously spread around here with their green leaf surface as factories, sugar factories, to help uh, support the clusters that you've left on here. Now the next pair is a little better. Let's see the next pair. Here's a vine before it's done. And the next vine shows it done properly. See, just take out enough to open the vine up, just enough to, uh, to uh, facilitate what you're after. That is to get dust and spray materials into the vine and still leave as many leaves as possible on the vine. Now, something else is still wrong with this. It's, been, it's done about two weeks too, uh, later than it should be. You should do crown suckering when the shoots are an average of about six to 12 inches long. Not when they're nearly three feet long. Because these shoots have utilized carbohydrate material out of the mother vine, but haven't had time to put much back in. And then you go out and yank them all off. It's better to go out and pull those shoots when they're four, six, 12 inch, uh, eight inches long. The sooner as you can do it, the better. Now, what's the purpose, I said, is to open up the vine to facilitate um, getting dust and spray materials into it, to prevent the entanglement of fruit later on with all those shoots. And again, just like winter pruning, by pulling off excess shoots and doing it early enough, you get the, the vigor where you want it. You, pre you prevent growth where you don't want it and get growth where you do want it by uh, crown suckering. Okay, that's all for that. Have the lights. <laughs> okay, in case you couldn't write, then while the lights were out, it's to prevent growth where you don't want it, concentrated where you do want it. So in, a, in effect, it's sort of a, a training operation, if you want a, a vine training operation. And I said that that's the way that cordon vine was in a way, a young cordon to prevent the entanglement of clusters, which is a minor reason, but to open up the head for better light exposure and better disease control is perhaps the main reason. All right, now, uh, crown suckering is not an operation that should have, should have to be continued all during the life of the vine. Certainly by the time the vine gets four, six to eight or 10 years old, you should not have to do any crown suckering. All those buds that are back in that part of the vine should be now covered up by enough wood growth, be latent enough, so that you should not get them pushing except under certain conditions. Now, if you severely prune the vine, and let's say, for example, that you had a vine that had four big arms on it and you just cut them all back to stubs, then those latent buds will push. That's the extreme example. But if you just give it a real severe pruning, you'll get some pushing of those latent buds, which will be uh, water sprouts, not suckers, but water sprouts, which, you, which will require crown suckering. And then the other way, of course, is sloppy pruning, where you, and, I, and you remember I griped at you all through the winter quarter about making those cuts clean when you're cutting off a one-year-old wood. 
because you've got those little buds right around the base, which will push out again. So if you still, if you have a few water, you'll invariably have water sprouts when the vines are young because those latent buds aren't that latent and they aren't that covered up and they will be pushing. And if you continually sloppily prune them back to a quarter of an inch or so, you can continue to have a good crop of crown suckers to pull off if that's what you want. So do a good job of pruning. But once again, don't take off too many, don't take off shoots, except carefully to thin them out so that you get just exactly what you want. Um, Dr. Winkler did a, quite an experiment uh, to study on this matter of, of the movement of carbohydrates from shoots that did not have fruit on them to shoots that do have fruit on them. And he did, uh, we could go into it for half an hour, but he went all the way from just taking a spur. Let's see, I guess we're through with this now. Thank you. He went all the way from just taking a spur with two shoots on it. One with just leaves only and one with just one leaf and a cluster. This type of thing, clear through all the various degrees you can get to it, to a head trained vine where he had canes out like this. And on this uh, shoot, on this uh, cane, he took off all the fruit. Well, not all of it, he had to leave someone for the experiment. <laughs> but he left just a few clusters way out on the end of this. And, and over here, he left a couple of shoots with only one leaf and a, clu and a clusters on it. Just one leaf. If you pull off the, all the leaves, the clusters will dry up. So he had this type of an experiment then, where these are the leaves and his clusters. And he found, this was Thompson seedless, and he found very little difference, no significant statistical difference between the sugar and acid of fruit over here where you had all the leaves. versus over here where you have only one leaf to hold the cluster on. Practically no, no statistical difference. But he did that in 1932. And I think Dr. Cleaver would have some comment to make on what you might think today. What's your? Well, it's true that there's, there's movement of carbohydrates from one chain to another. Mm -hmm. But two or three degrees bricks, yeah. And you were able to show significant. See, Winkler got, well, it's not really important, but he. Within a single cane, there was no significant difference within a single cane. But if you defoliated shoots from one cane to another cane, so what we concluded is there's readily movement of sugar from shoots on the same cane. From here to here, yeah. In other words, and there's also movement from uh, sugar from one cane to the next, but not as much as there is within one cane. No. Now you got that? He said that he got on a single cane. See, I underlined this two or three times. On a single cane, they got no difference between uh, a cluster of fruit here with only one leaf and a cluster of fruit over here with all the leaves on it. But they did get some difference between this cane and this cane with this type of thing going on. <laughs> now, this is fairly interesting. Uh, Dr. Cleaver will give a whole lecture on this later on, so we're sort of moving into his carbohydrate lecture. But this is rather interesting that you can get fairly ready 
easy movement of carbohydrate from uh, this one with all the leaves, and maybe I ought to draw all the leaves on here too. Boy, I've got this all fouled up. This is worse than some of those exam pictures. Uh, uh, you can get rather ready movement of leaves of sugar from here to here. During, as he said, with no measurable difference on the effect of the sugar in the fruit on a given cane. And you can get fairly obvious movement, even though there may be a reduced, obvious movement of sugar from this side over to this side during the growing season. But in right this week, you don't get very ready movement of sugar from one spur to another. Otherwise, why would you worry about whether or not you leave more buds on a big spur and less buds on a weak spur? If the sugar can move around that easy, slosh around in it, so to speak. But it doesn't move readily from one part of the vine to the other in the spring from the dormant storage situation, but does move apparently fairly readily in the summer. And uh, what the explanation for this is, I don't know, except that the wintertime storage form, of course, is starch. And the summertime, you've got a fluid situation of sugar, which doesn't, can, the sugar can move from this, position over to here while it's still sugar. But to move from one spur to another, we got a spur over here and a spur over here. To move from one spur to another at this time of the year, the storage form is starch and it has to convert to sugar before it can move. And apparently there's some mechanism in here that, that almost prevents that, a very far movement. But in the summertime with the green shoots, it can slosh around. Okay, that's, you know what that means? <laughs> huh? It could be related to the fact that the, these shoots are all very rapidly growing right now and there's a lot of, I mean, everything needs carbohydrates. Everything's screaming for it, yeah. yeah. A temp right, a temporary surplus. It could, it's got to go somewhere. And if it doesn't go into the next shoot, then it's going to head for the root system. You're right, or storage areas. Yeah. But anyway, to the, to me, this has always been a little bit of a contradiction, which I want to try to explain to you, because. As I say, originally occurred to me, well, if it moves around so easily, why worry about the spur pruning? Just leave them all the same length. But that carbohydrate is starch, and, and as Dr. Cleaver points out, there is such a, a, an extreme rapid demand for the carbohydrate at this time of year that it probably doesn't have a chance to go anywhere else. It has to go right into the immediate demand for it. Okay, so much for that. Okay, now, uh, another reason for, uh, I told you I was trying to give you these things the other day in decreasing order. Um, I said that you can use uh, leaf removal to prevent drought. I said that uh, the leaf surface, of course, is the main way that the plant loses moisture. And if you're in an area where you're in absolutely low moisture content, then you can probably uh, keep the vine alive and still make something of a crop by doing some topping of the vine, cutting off part of the growth to get rid of uh, evaporative leaf surface area. And this is carried on in some areas, uh, notably uh, one place where Winkler likes to talk about is down around Santa Maria area before they had the dam and the lake and the water. Uh, and one or two of those old Italians in that area have been able to grow uh, a ton and a half or two tons of Zinfandel per acre where they have about nine or ten inches of water. But they go in and, and crown sucker severely, like that first set of slides, and then go back later and top. 
in order to get a couple of tons the acre. Well, you say you can't make a living making two tons the acre. You can if you grow your own grapes, make your own wine, sell it to your local neighbors. So uh, under a situation like that, you could, as I say, this just happens to be physiological, but you could uh, use summer pruning to cut down on the water usage. I said that uh, you could use it somewhat to uh, provide shade. And of course, this is a training operation, which I was showing here, but you can top vines all the shoots on a vine and get the same effect and get some shading of the fruit that might be, let's do it right this time, that might be hanging in here by, instead of the vine going up on a long single shoot and just draping over and exposing the fruit, you could cut the tops off and get some lateral push of growth to give you an umbrella effect for some shading. And finally, uh, we get down to uh, um, a, a type of summer pruning, which is just the removal of leaves around the clusters. And this is a very common, uh, uh, obvious, and necessary practice in the growth of table fruit, to remove leaves in the vicinity near the clusters of fruit to prevent scarring of the fruit, you've got to remove tendrils at the same time, sometimes tendrils and clusters, or tendrils and leaves, close to the cluster. And it's fairly common, to, uh, with cardinal, for example, to remove the leaves up to one node above the cluster. One node above the cluster. Yes? Well, wait, wait till you get the wait you get the lecture on that. You'll find that we, it doesn't jive with what he said either. <laughs> um, we could go into a whole lecture on that, but I won't. there's there's arguments about taking leaves opposite the cluster not being correct for mineral nutrition analysis too. But uh, it doesn't hold for grapes because we've tried it. So uh, some of these things hold for certain crops and not for others. But anyway, let's see what, what we're talking about on this leaf removal. And then, whoop, I thought I was through with slides and not. Okay. Now, you saw the slide before, but just to remind you of it, uh, here's, here's the way uh, the cardinals look about uh, two or three weeks before they start to change color. And remember what I've told you out there when we're talking about trellis and so forth, that a cluster of grapes wants just what you want. You want to settle on the front porch, have a nice breeze blowing, and have plenty of aeration, but not be in the sun. So this is a, a sloping trellis of cardinal, and this is the way it looks before the grower goes in to work it over. The next slide shows the job after it's done. These are not exactly wonderful cardinals, but it gives you the idea. You see, you pull all the leaves off up to about one, and you pull the laterals off too, by the way, excuse me, pull the laterals off because the laterals will entangle in the fruit. So you pull laterals and tendrils and, and leaves off and up to about, the say, usually the industry pulls them off, one leaf above the cluster. Now, it, does this have a very great effect on the carbohydrate nutrition of those clusters? If not, if not, why not? Because of the, where the leaves are. The leaves are already in the shade. And Dr. Cleaver will tell you later on, the leaves in the shade are parasites. So you're not really losing when you pull off these leaves, especially under a sloping trellis. If the sloping trellis and these leaves are down under here, you're really not losing as much photosynthetic factory as you think you are because you're pulling off first old leaves and leaves that are shaded. So keep that in mind, okay, regardless of what Dr. Sachs said. Okay, and then another reason for uh, uh, summer pruning is to prevent wind injury or breakage. You remember I showed you this slide 
And uh, this is our French column bar out in the vineyard. And it's often hard to tell which side is up. But uh, on a, an extremely vigorous growing variety in a windy area, it's a whole lot better to go through the business of topping the vine to save most of the shoot than it is to just let the shoot grow and get broken off. So in Livermore area, Winter Brothers pra practice it. Do you still do it, Eric? Uh, not so much, much now. Used to chop uh, machete the tops of the vines. And in some areas, you might want to do that to prevent wind breakage of your shoots. But this is in extreme areas. It better not grow grapes in such windy areas or grow low, bigger varieties, not French columbar. OK. Is that the last slide, Mark? OK. Now, this um, sheet that I handed out to you, I said we discussed it at the end here, um, is, a, is rather interesting in that it shows the real effect of summer pruning on mature vines. But I think, I think the most interesting thing about it is the history behind it. Later on, toward the end of the quarter, we're going to talk about Pierce's disease, which is a virus. And Pierce's disease has had two or three epidemics in the state over the years. But back in the 30s, when they had one of the three real major epidemics, um, the, some, some of the growers got a bright idea. See, Pierce's disease is spread by, a, uh, by insects, which are called sharpshooters, not leafhoppers. They're related to leafhoppers, but they're, they, uh, they're just related to them. And they feed on grass, and they transmit the virus by, by then moving up on the grapevine and feeding on it, just like the malaria mosquito spreads malaria. So these growers thought, well, gee whiz, uh, we got this vine, and we got all this down the upper area, we got all this trellis down with all this foliage hanging down here. We got all this grass growing here where these insects are on it. Let's stymie them. Let's cut off the, let's cut off the shoots up to here. And then see what the little buggers do. Well, that's the basis of this work that you're looking at here then. And that uh some work was done down in Tulare County where the, the main headquarters emperor is done. And they took off about, as you see there, in 1942. This is a little, I don't even have a copy of it. I've got my old notes. <laughs> Who's got a copy? <laughs> well, I think I can follow them on. You got an extra? Thank you. You see there in 1942, it's the year they did it, and they had a comparison in which this was not done plus where it was done. And they estimated that they took off 40% of the leaf surface about the time the fruit st uh, first began to show some color in midsummer. And what did it do? Well, you see, they did it late enough. It didn't make that first year. It didn't have a big effect on the crop. 18.6 against 17 is not enough to get excited about. And of course, they had already uh, adjusted the vines over, so they had the same number of clusters. But even that late doing it that late, they still had a 10% reduction in the weight of the clusters. And I don't understand this number of berries bit. Uh, the ones that uh, got the leaves pulled off had more berries on them, but they, the clusters were still 10% smaller. That first year, this tulare, this part above the gap, was just done in the farmer's field as a demonstration, more or less. So we get to the more detailed data later on. But uh, look at the weight of the berries. It knocked the weight of the berries down by at least 10%. But the big important thing is the percent color. Because color and sugar then is the evidence of maturity. And they took off 40% of that leaf surface just at the time when the vine needed it the worst. And it really, and they didn't get uh, sugar records. I don't know why. It's a pity they didn't, but they didn't. So the big effect. That first year, when it's done in midsummer, was a reduction in fruit maturity and fruit size. 
Okay, the next year in 43, it says none and 40%, but those are just the same two treatments. See, they didn't take the leaves off two years in a row. They just took them off the first year. That's just the same treatment I'm trying to refer to there. So the one that had no leaves removed the previous year, look at the terrific difference in crop. 24 kilos against 13.8, almost 100% difference in crop. And 50% uh, uh, difference in number of clusters. And look at the weight of the clusters, all the way across. But why was the color more or less the same at the end of the season? You see, with a very light crop, only a half a crop, by the end of the season, the vine had been able to produce enough leaves to, to proportionally uh, mature that fruit the same as the other. Do you follow that? It only had half a crop, it only had half the uh, crop, and, but, uh, but it had its full amount of leaves so that by the end of the year, it, had, it uh, had come back well enough so that it actually had better color than the, than the fully cropped vine. So the effect the first year of such a big removal as such as 40% leaves is to reduce the quality of the crop. The quality, i.e. maturity, sugar, dairy size, acid. The effect the second year is a, re is a reduced crop a quantity of crop. Quality the first year, quantity the second year. Okay, and then on the basis of that, uh, Winkler got excited and uh, carried on and set up a, a more detailed experiment here at Davis, and that's the next data there you see, 43 and 44, in which he went from no leaf removal to, now this was hand removal and machete and what have you, to 20%, 40%, 50% leaf removal. And he did this in early in July, about a month earlier than they did it down in, in Tulare. And you see he got uh, some differences in crop, but uh, it varied. We go way over this time now and pick up the sugar, the color, and the, and the sugar. And you see the ones where he removed no leaves, he had 93% of, of them were colored, where he removed 50% leaves, he had only 37% colored a 60% reduction. And look what it did to the sugar. So see, it really knocked the color, and it knocked the sugar, and it knocked the berry size. 5.4 uh, 5 5 grams per berry down to 4.7. <coughs> then in 1944, and remember once again, he did not remove leaves the second year. That's just to, to designate the treatments. Look, in the next year, just... What, what happens below that in this work here at Davis just sharply emphasizes what they found out in a rough way at Tulare. You see, in 44, look what it did to the crop. From 10.7 kilos down to 3.7. But, again, go to the color and sugar, and by the end of the year, there's no real difference at all. So, an extreme removal of midsummer leaves in one year will affect the quality of that year's crop and will affect the quantity of the next year's crop. And this ought to be obvious to you when you know that leaves are necessary to form, to develop the flower clusters and the buds and all this. So this is why we spend so much time on this to say don't go out there and strip those vines bald-headed uh, just to thin them out and make them easy to look at and all this because every one of those leaves, if it's exposed to the sun, is a factory working for you. But on the other hand, you've got to get some of them out of the way for various and sundry reasons, and you better remember the reasons. Okay, that's all for today. <laughs>